So a couple of weeks ago, here on my YouTube channel, I shared a one-star review of a brand new West End musical that I was invited to go and see called Opening Night. The show stars Sheridan Smith. It's currently playing at the Gil Good Theatre. It is based on the 70s John Cassavetes film of the same name, directed and conceived and adapted by Ivo Van Hove, the polarizing director, with music by Rufus Wainwright and a stellar supporting cast to boot. Now, as evidenced by and articulated within my one-star review video, I found very little redeeming quality within this entire show. And because I very rarely, if never, share reviews that extremely negative, people were understandably shocked in my comments section. But was my critical response to the show in line with the rest of London's critics? Put more simply, did every Everyone else hate opening night as much as I did. Today, we're going to find out. Oh my god, hey, welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional independent theatre critic working here on social media. I get invited to go and see shows, and then I review them with video content that you can see here. You can also find more theatre-themed content from me over on Instagram, over on TikTok. I am Mickey Joe Theatre on all platforms. Now, one thing that I enjoy almost as much as reviewing theatre here on YouTube is doing a deep dive into the other reviews that people have have written because I am endlessly fascinated by differences in critical opinion. And it's also something I really welcome. Not only do I enjoy debate, which is a fancy way of saying I like arguing, but when it comes to the theater, you are welcome, if not encouraged, to form your own completely unique artistic interpretation of a show. That means if everyone else likes it and says that it's a revolutionary masterpiece, you don't have to. You're allowed to think that it sucks. If everyone else is saying that it's terrible and you actually have a nice time, you don't have to feel guilty about that either. You can say that you love it. As my good friend Ellie Talks Theatre often reminds us, theatre is subjective. And that is what we are going to see today in a whole spectrum of different reviews for the musical opening night. Now, the reason I wanted to make this video is not only because this is one of the most sort of controversially reviewed shows of the year in the West End, but there is a lot of media spin happening thereafter. And there are a lot of tabloid articles about like this disastrous show and Sheridan Smith begging fans to come and see it and people are walking out and falling asleep and will it fall down early, which means close prematurely. And I'm not a producer on the show. I'm not there every night seeing what's happening in the audience. I'm not tracking how well ticket sales are doing. We don't have public grosses here in the UK to let us know how well a show is selling, so I really can't speak to the possibility of this closing prematurely. I got the sense that it wasn't selling as well as Shirley Valentine did with Sheridan Smith in the West End last year because that was more closely linked to her own personal brand as a performer and people knew the title and certainly the reviews for this didn't help. That's not to say that no one was intrigued enough by negative reviews to go and get a ticket. That happens to me constantly. I will much more often book to go see a one-star reviewed show than like a three, for example. But what I want to do with this video is to glimpse beyond the eye-catching tabloid headlines and really look into what has actually been said about this show. Hopefully that may also help all of you decide if this is something that you want to go and see. I am not obnoxious enough to assume that you will always align yourselves artistically with my opinion. I don't expect that, and I don't think that it's particularly likely. So we are going to read some other negative reviews, but we're also going to read some of the positive reviews. Stay tuned, let's talk through them all. Now, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for more critical discourse, more of my reviews of shows that I've been to go and see, as well as lots of other theatre-themed video content. Also, as always, I welcome all of your thoughts about the shows that we are discussing. Comment down below if you have seen Opening Night, what you thought of the show, and what star rating you would have given it if you were a critic. For now, though, let's start with a review that doesn't come with a star rating, but certainly makes its point clear. So this is a review from Variety written by David Benedict, and the headline tells us a lot of what we need to know up front. Sheridan Smith's turn cannot save Eva Van Hove and Rufus Wainwright's monotonous musical adaptation. And I like that even in a very clearly negative headline, it highlights Sheridan Smith's excellent performance, which is something that I talked about as well. The show follows the onstage slash offstage life of Myrtle, a leading actress who is as terrified of aging as she is of the demands placed upon her as a star. But where Cassavetes artfully constructed Myrtle and built 
result an intriguing blur between what is happening in her head and in the play being rehearsed. The blur here topples into a mess. I did not get a sense of that, I'll be honest. Some of the fault for that is due to the decision to add an onstage crew supposedly filming a documentary about the show and whose fierce close-up work is splashed on the screen. I do wonder, because I think that the actual material of the show itself is just deeply, inherently flawed, but the added aspect of the camera crew didn't work for me for a variety of reasons, like it did establish this very exposing, sort of voyeuristic quality, but I'm very intrigued about what the show would have been like if that were to be stripped away, and maybe in a more intimate venue, like a Donmar Warehouse or Almeida version of this show without all the cameras. One can, of course, weave multiple plot strands together to surreal but emotionally dazzling effect, but that requires a directorial clarity that's lacking here, and the underwritten book and unfocused staging means the combination merely blurs. I agree with all of the above, and I think that a lot of the interpretations I'm hearing of people, you know, really finding it fascinating and exciting, I think you can, but you have to meet the show, not even halfway, more than halfway. I think you have to meet the show 75% of the way and bring a lot of your willingness to piece things together because it's not doing that for you. It's impenetrable in that sense. We're insufficiently engaged to care. And this was another thing I talked about is that there is no emotional capacity within the show. Even the early pivotal death of Myrtle's desperate young fan, spoiler alert, we are going to talk about the plot of this in these reviews, who crucially comes back to haunt her, fails to register properly, which I said as well, the way it's staged does not work. Thank you, David Benedict. Given Van Hove's rightly garlanded a view from the bridge, incredible piece of staging, to his more controversial West Side Story and a flatlined all about Eve in London, asking for a literal straightforward approach from the director is, for better and worse, pointless. Most problematically, the video work completely pulls focus, the actors are robbed of agency in the space, since watching faces in tight, hard close-up, wildly unflattering when singing, he adds, is always going to be more attention-grabbing than watching them on the stage. And yet I think there are ways that this can work, because I think Sunset Boulevard captured this very well. I know a lot of people are just anti-cameras, like, in any circumstance, but I think Sunset Boulevard, I've said this many times, but a cinematic story inherently, in which film is used as a framing device by a screenwriter narrator, I think that works. Didn't like it here. Oh, he said something else that I said as well. Though it feels literal-minded to point this out, we keep being told we're watching previews, but Van Hove bafflingly leaves the director, underused Hadley Fraser, writer and creative team sitting on the side as if in the rehearsal room. This is so confusing because we cannot tell the difference between a preview performance and a rehearsal, and it's really important that we are able to within the plot, and it ends up making the whole thing look like a film set. There's a lot of talk of Rufus Wayne Wright's work here, a lot of praise for him as an artist, but it says his work here feels unshapely, too reflective, and crucially unedited, which feel very shrewd observations, I will say. His meandering songs neither build nor guide the listener with any dramatic shape. David Benedict, I love the way you are reviewing a score here, because a lot of London critics, I have to say, do not necessarily really investigate the music as thoroughly as they do the book when it comes to a musical. Nor are his lyrics his finest work. Witness the oft-repeated, you gotta make magic out of tragic. Of Sheridan Smith, he says, she's game and the least of the show's problems. She handles both music and character with dedication. But as with all the characters, her material lacks the depth to allow her to shine. I agree implicitly. Van Hove is many things, but the least of them is a playwright. And this is probably the most egregious problem, is that there is no real writer of experience attached to the show. This is a director adapting this film, this screenplay, and sort of conceiving and writing this book by himself. One more thing from here I must share with you. Most bizarre of all, having presented an evening of unremitting angst, a bizarrely amateurish we've all been in a musical curtain call is inexplicably added. That, if little else, will linger in the memory. And you will find, if you've seen this show, that the song will haunt you is the word I'm going to use. There ain't a wrong way on Broadway. I'll let you decide in the comments section what star rating that would have been uh, if American publications used star ratings. Next, let's go to another unrated one. This is going to be the New York Times review. The New York Times does not always, or not really often, review shows in London unless they're of sort of international interest, which I guess this was. So the headline is, A stylish movie becomes a sludgy travesty. This is reviewed by the critic Human Barakat, and the first line alone, fairly devastating. In a London auditorium, a work of art is being 
desecrated. So this is someone who clearly has an enormous fondness for the film, which is a very interesting perspective to bring to a review of the theatrical adaptation, which clearly he's not a fan of. John Cassavetti's understatedly stylish 1977 movie about an actress struggling with midlife ennui has been reimagined as a musical by the Belgian director Eva van Hove, and the result is a travesty. I don't know that it matters that he's Belgian, but it is it is very much a travesty nonetheless. Talks about the plot and then summarizes by saying it's a compelling storyline filled with dramatic possibilities, but opening night, which runs at the Gielgud Theatre through July 27th, hopefully, that's also not how you spell theatre in the UK, bad New York Times, is scuppered by a series of poor choices. Smith is miscast as Myrtle for a start. Her onstage bearing exudes a homely approachability rather than high-strung poise or inscrutable aloofness. I wonder if that plays better when you have more of a sense of her status within the UK theatrical sphere. The fact that she is an award-winning, accomplished, um, and highly esteemed actress, because I didn't get that at all. Benjamin Walker's Wooden as Maurice, I said the same thing. Roll the tapes, I said Wooden. Myrtle's stage co-star and ex-partner, who Cassavetes himself played charmingly in the film, which, as it happens, answers a lot of questions. The estranged couple's brittle onstage chemistry is an essential ingredient in the drama, that's hard to say quickly. Here, they seem like actual strangers. Haas's spectral Nancy is a disconcertingly cutesy symbol of youthful feminine vitality, suggesting not so much a young woman as a pubescent child. Yeah. The songs by Rufus Wainwright are algorithmically bland. Several address aging, including the unsubtly titled A Change of Life, about menopause, and Makes One Wonder, a duet in which Myrtle and Sarah realise that, as women of a certain age, they may have more in common than they'd like to admit. There is a brief foray into rock opera during an excruciating scene in which Myrtle, having figured out she must banish Nancy Spectre to get herself back on track, scuffles with the girl child amid flashing strobe lights and 1980s-style power riffs. It's so schlocky that it almost feels like a send-up. Do you know that was one of my few enjoyable moments of the show, simply because I thought the staging approach to that was very novel, and you know, it was you understood what was going on. Jan Verseveld's set is a theatre within a theatre. The rehearsal space occupies the foreground, and a row of vanity mirrors at the rear of the stage represents the backstage area. As in Van Hove's 2019 adaptation of All About Eve, and many of you have drawn comparisons in the comments section of my video as well, another story about the emotional travise of an ageing actress. Camera operators stalk its perimeter, transmitting close-up real-time footage of the actors onto a big screen above the stage. The idea is to ramp up the psychodrama by bringing us up close and personal, but there isn't much intensity to intensify. Which I think is a very perceptive point about why the cameras don't feel like they necessarily add much. If the material isn't there to begin with, then uh, it's not going to work. The occasional bird's eye view is particularly unnecessary, unless you happen to have an interest in the topography of hairlines. Near the end, as the characters make their final preparations for opening night, the big screen cuts to recorded footage of theatergoers passing through the Gielgud foyer a couple of hours earlier, a clever touch that spurred a ripple of amused murmurs from the audience, but these are slim pickings. Do you know I'd actually forgotten that they did that, in the madness of it all? And I sort of resent, I don't think I saw myself on the screen, but I sort of resent being on a West End stage and it being in this show in particular. Pre-recorded footage of me has actually appeared at the Vaudeville Theatre before, so it wasn't my debut. And we finish with some really interesting commentary about how the show plays right now. So as an artist yearning to take back control of her narrative, Myrtle should resonate at a time when questions of agency for women and minorities, among others, are on many people's minds. But Van Hove's corny treatment trivializes her suffering. And then we finish by once again calling it a sludgy melodrama. So again, no star rating, I'll let you decide. Didn't feel like a high one. But let's go next to a one-star review. So this is going to be The Evening Standard. This is a London-based publication now. And this was a one-star review from Nick Curtis. He said, even Sheridan Smith can't save this dismally muddled show. Again, nice to highlight Sheridan's performance amidst all of the chaos, because a lot of the tabloid articles about the show's reception are drawing her into it quite unfairly. This dismally muddled, self-important, furtively misogynist, thank you, someone else for saying it, musical about an actress going to pieces, squanders the talents of everyone involved, doesn't it just? Even breaking Sheridan Smith's unique ability to connect with an audience. Very on the money, very, very on the money, because that's what made Shirley Valentine so brilliant last year. This was a one-woman play that she did in the West End, a revival of the iconic Willie Russell play, and it's just her on stage solo performance for two acts. She got an Olivier Award nomination earlier this month, and rightfully so, and that worked on so many emotional levels 
on all of which this failed to. As I said in my review, it's only right at the end of the show that she actually has enough space to work her magic. She is otherwise inhibited throughout. It's adapted from John Cassavetti's 1977 film by Eva Van Hove, whose London productions are either sublime or, like this one, awful, which does resonate with my experience, I will say. Singer-songwriter Rufus Wainwright contributes his first ever musical score, a hodgepodge, oh you don't get a lot of hodgepodge in reviews these days, love that, of genre pastiche and schoolboy rhyme so lame I hope it will also be his last. Oh, I don't actually agree. I think Rufus Wainwright, uh, because of the nature of the rest of his music, I think he really has a good score within him, I just think he needs more effective collaborators who are actually writers. The use of live video adds another tiresome layer of introspection to a project wedged firmly up its own fundament. Oh, this actually gets quite heated. The underlying message is that oafish audiences don't appreciate the pain of creatives who crucify themselves on stage every night, and that it's tough to be a woman. The talents of Smith and Wainwright seem inextricably linked to their sensitivity, but Van Hove leaves both of them horribly exposed here. He puts Smith in particular through the ringer, forcing her to confront her vulnerabilities and blaming us for watching. How dare he? Wow. Nick Curtis, not pulling any punches with this one. Then talking about the other characters, improbably saintly producer David, oafishly aggressive director Manny, the word oafish getting a lot of a lot of use in this review. Here are some thoughts I haven't seen anyone else talking about. Smith is required to change costume on stage and is repeatedly mauled. She and Amy Lennox as Manny's Stepfordish wife are often barefoot and ingratiating around masterful patriarchs. Both they and Hughes can at least sing Wainwright's embarrassing songs on key, which is more than can be said for some cast members. Oh, I think Hadley Fraser sang it well, but I, I I can't say I remember well enough. I've blocked that out. Perceptively, Nick Curtis references the 2006 uh, version that Van Hove did in Amsterdam. He called it an earlier musical version. I do believe that that was just a play, in fact, uh, as well as the 24-hour play The Second Woman, captivatingly performed by Ruth Wilson at the Young Vic last year, seeing an actress play a scene from it a hundred times with a hundred different men. Did you know I hadn't made the connection to the Cassavetes film? Um, and I tried to go to that. At one point, I had tickets to that, and then it got delayed by COVID, and then you know, I'd aged too much in the intervening years to go and spend 24 hours in a theatre. The show becomes a series of needy pleas for love and tedious emotional collapses, while Wainwright's score skips from a Ravel homage, Ravel was mentioned in one of the earlier ones but I didn't pick up on it, slash rip-off, to hollow torch songs to footling show tunes. After disastrous previews, some changes have apparently been made, I've heard this as well, including the removal of a prolonged vacuuming scene, yes really, hadn't heard about that, now deeply fascinated, comment down below if you know what that was, but the show remains a hot mess unsalvageable. Finishing with a single sentence, roll on closing night. Wow, and with reviews like that, maybe it'll come faster. Unsalvageable is a very damning adjective, but again, I don't disagree with it. I like a very articulate critical response ending with hot mess. It's so interesting to me how our vocabulary as a society has evolved over time. Let's see if we can't find a two-star review now. I think maybe... The Stage did a two-star review? Yes, they did. So this is Sam Marlowe, chief theatre critic for The Stage newspaper. Sheridan Smith struggles to illuminate this weird new musical from Eva Van Hove and Rufus Wainwright based on John Cassavetti's 1977 film. A strange adaptation of a strange film. Now, this is the first review we're reading that has been written by a woman, interestingly enough. Though I will give Nick Curtis a lot of credit for acknowledging the plight of the women in the cast and the show's misogynistic feel. If Cassavetti's original succeeds in compelling thanks largely to striking cinematography and a raw performance from Gina Rowlands, this version which features live video footage is so aimless and tonally muddled that it feels downright weird. Sure, sure it does. Which might be less of a problem if it were not ultimately a bit boring. Another good point, if the whole thing were more captivatingly interesting, which some people have said it is, then <laughs> a lot more would be forgiven. Myrtle, the rapidly unraveling star, is played by Sheridan Smith with an arresting blend of wit, bravado, desperation, and vulnerability, the camera tracking her every nuance of expression. And there is strong support from Hadley Fraser, Amy Lennox, Nicola Hughes, and Benjamin Walker. Those are the ones who've been singled out here. I think Joss Slovic deserves more love. He really doesn't have enough material to work with in this show, but I enjoyed him. Ultimately, though, circling back to what we've heard elsewhere, it's tough for any of them to make much of characters who are little more than props in Myrtle's frenzied whirlwind, and even Myrtle herself remains an infuriating enigma. Her crisis is triggered by the death in a traffic collision of a teenage fan who reminds her of her younger self, but the vague ramblings that the incident gives rise to, the circuitous action and the horror movie flailings and contortions of Shira Haas as the dead girl just seem gratuitous and self-indulgent. At the beginning of that, something was said which I also said 
is that the whole thing feels far too central around her. None of these characters are really allowed to become entire human beings because they only exist in relation to this central character. And it doesn't really feel real. If the whole thing had been directed with more of a viewpoint, perhaps it would be clear to us that what we're seeing is not actually reality, but her interpretation of everything that's happening. Are we actually seeing the director or are we seeing the director as she perceives him to be? That's a question that I have that did not get answered. None of this is helped at all by Wainwright's songs. He is not doing well in these reviews so far. Most are jaunty ditties on guitar, banjo, and brass, peculiarly at odds with the jagged darkness of the narrative. Sure. Some are wildly overall ballads, which in extreme close-up are wearing to watch. However deftly, they are delivered. And I think anyone who's seen the Les Mis movie is probably immune to that at this point. I didn't, I didn't find that to be the biggest issue with the music. Why is she singing? Wales Hughes despairing Sarah as Myrtle derails yet another scene, a question to which there is simply no good answer. In fact, it's hard to know what the point is of any of it. Speak on it, Sam Marlowe. What was the point of this entire thing? What is the point? Spoiler alert, there isn't one because it's inherently very self-indulgent, like has been said. There's an indistinct feminist subtext about gender inequality and restrictive beauty standards both in the entertainment industry and in our wider culture, but nothing is properly articulated. The cast generates enough energy to keep the whole thing in motion, whether it is worth their while or yours, is another matter. And I would add to that that it's not only not worth your while, it's probably not worth your money. But that is just my opinion. We are going to read some more positive reviews as we increase in star ratings. One other thing I will add is that the cast are particularly praised in this stage review, uh, while also acknowledging that there's not much that they can do with the material. But we talk often in reviews about shows whose material is improved by having certain performers. And I dread to think how rough this actually would be if it didn't have such a fantastic cast. Let's quickly, just because I want to hear more perspectives of uh, female critics, let's go to the What's On Stage review by Sarah Crompton, which I believe was also a two-star. Yes, it was. It's a two-star review, and it calls it a baffling waste of talent, which very much continues on the point that we were just talking about with the exceptional cast. Eva Van Hove is a director who likes building boxes within boxes, refracting images of recess, mingling fantasy and reality, blurring the boundaries between artifice and truth. What a gorgeous sentence. He also likes adapting films for the stage and creating plays about theatre itself, all of which goes some way to understanding why he wanted to turn John Cassavetti's opening night into a stage musical but it doesn't explain for a second why the result is such a confusing mess. This is a show that mystifyingly seems to fail from the moment it begins. Now, Sarah does seem to have a little less affection for the film upon which the show is based. She says, Cassavetti's movie, which has acquired a cult status since its release in 1977, may be offbeat and disconcerting in its portrayal of a theatre company working up to its Broadway opening night, but within its effectless, nuanced narrative is a clear plot. In transferring the film to the stage, Van Hove, who is adapter as well as director, which is a red flag, by the way, deliberately disrupts an already jagged story still further, introducing a documentary film crew who beam the cast's reaction onto huge screens. Sometimes the screen shows what we are seeing on stage, sometimes it is a little behind. Maddeningly so, I'm glad someone else said this. And sometimes, confusingly, it moves our attention to an action that is happening at the edge of things. Also very true. I don't think that it's used particularly deliberately or particularly well throughout. Wainwright's music, rather well played by an offstage band, good for them, getting a positive note in the mess of all of this, also veers wildly in tone. What it never provides is a truly memorable melody or a song that carries the meaning of the show. It's not unattractive, but it is never essential. A very good point about how, you know, this doesn't end up ultimately really feeling like a show that wants to be a musical. It feels very much like a play that happens to contain songs. That line about not having a song that carries the meaning of the show, something I hadn't even considered, but utterly true. She says that Van Hove's direction seems to sprawl as if the whole concept is escaping his grasp. About three different stories grapple for attention. One is about Myrtle's haunting by Bolshe Nancy. The second concerns Myrtle's disintegration in her relationships with her ex-husband and co-star Maurice. And the third about her battles with the playwright Sarah over what it means to be a woman of a certain age uh, is the least well-developed though it produces one of the best songs, Life is Thin, which is both over-intrusive and under-explained. Some specific praise for Sheridan Smith here. Smith battles gamely, singing well, but struggling to gain much purchase on the character. And then something else that's surely been playing a lot of other people's minds. In some ways, her casting must have seemed like another piece of meta-theatre. Myrtle's complaints about intrusion and fear of failure appear to mirror Smith's own challenges. This makes reference to some previous experience she's had when she was starring in Funny Girl in the West End. Around her, an excellent supporting 
supporting cast also do their best. Walker is charismatic and funny. Uh, Hadley Fraser is almost entirely wasted as Manny, and Amy Lennox has too little to do as his wife Dorothy, a fault inherited from the film. In the second half, the efforts of the entire ensemble actually bring about a measure of coherence. It's not the least engaging evening of musical theatre I've ever sat through, but it is one of the most baffling wastes of talent. I think it might be one of the least engaging evenings of musical theatre I've ever sat through, and I'm fascinated as to what Sarah Crompton would rank lower on that list. But I have indulged in the negative stuff that aligns with what I personally thought of the show. It's interesting reading the jump from a one to a two star review. And, uh, you know, I think both of those from the stage and from what's on stage seemed to highlight the efforts of the cast and their performances and that being the factor that drew the whole thing up. And when I was considering a star rating, certainly I thought the cast are as strong as they are does that warrant a two-star review when everything is crumbling around them? In any case, we've done that, we've read the negative stuff, let's carry on moving up in the world and go to a three-star review, and I believe there was one in The Times. Indeed there was. So this is a three-star review from The Times' own theatre critic Clive Davis. At one point in this very strange musical about backstage drama at a Broadway play, bear in mind this is one of the more positive reviews we've read so far, a character remarks that half the audience loved it, half the audience hated it. Those words may well become the epitaph for the collaboration between singer-songwriter Rufus Wainwright and that ever-provocative Belgian director Ivo van Hove. People love to point out that he's Belgian. I don't think that matters, honestly. The songs and script are occasionally inspired, but more often maddeningly opaque. God knows what Smith's army of admirers will make of it all, Shirley Valentine this is not, and evidently, from what we're hearing, they seem to either be confused or walking out. Still, Smith, who has had to contend with her share of personal demons, that's making reference to the same thing we just talked about, deserves credit for taking on the role of an actress who is suffering a meltdown. If you haven't seen the lugubrious John Cassavetes film that provides the inspiration for Wainwright and Van Hove, you're in for a very confusing evening, that evidently was my mistake. A flop when it was first released in 1977, it has since become a cult classic for reasons I don't quite understand. Interesting to see that opinions of the original film don't necessarily seem to correlate to opinions of the stage show. We've had very negative reviews from people who loved the film, we've had negative reviews from people who did not like the film, and then this more positive review from a critic who evidently does not have a lot of love for the film. Van Hove has already staged a non-musical Dutch language adaptation, as I suspected it was a play. Uh, Clive then also mentions the second woman at the uh, Young Vic. If this show has one advantage over the movie, it's that Smith can't help injecting a layer of self-deprecating humour. She evokes a measure of vulnerability, briefly stripping down to her underwear and costume changes. I mean, that's not untrue, but it's a weird way to phrase it. And it seems to be thanks to her that this is lifted from a two star to a three, because I'm still not seeing an abundance of positives. It says Van Hove's book piles confusion upon confusion, and the other characters, uh, including director Manny, playwright Sarah, and long-suffering producer David, are thinly sketched. Amy Lennox has an equally thankless task, playing Manny's neglected wife, doesn't she just? At least Van Hove's trademark use of video screens makes sense. Interesting. We, the audience, watch ourselves entering the foyer. There's even a moment when a drunken Myrtle has to be coaxed back into the theatre from outside the Gilgood stage doors. They do do a little bit of a Sunset Boulevard moment here, where the cameras go outside and Sheridan Smith is lying in the gutter, while security staff loiter around to stop anyone disrupting the live theatre that's happening outside. Now these reviews are always frustratingly limited by their word counts. I would love for Clive to be able to expand here on why he thought the use of video screens made sense, because that's not something we've heard echoed in any of those other reviews. Some of Wainwright's songs weave a haunting chamber opera ambience, yet in the second half in particular, too many are derailed by overly dense lyrics. Though he concludes in a very balanced way, I'm still glad I saw this show, Smith's fans probably won't be so pleased. And I do think if you have to conclude with, I'm still glad I saw it, it doesn't read like a three star to me. Did that read like a three star review to you? Out of five, that's more than half. I don't think that read positively enough to be a three star. Three star is still meant to be good. And now I'm really thirsting for something much more positive. So I know there is a four star from Arifa Akbar in The Guardian. Let's go read that one. Okay, let's do it. Opening night review. Sheridan Smith's boozy meltdown shakes up musical theatre. And I already have a little bit of a beef with this, just from the concept of it shaking up musical theatre, as if musical theatre is something that needed to be shaken up 
in this way with a show like this. I think this does shake up musical theatre, but like a Coke can that's being shaken that someone's already urinated in. Anyway, that colourful metaphor aside, let's read the rest of the review. Smith plays a Broadway star in the midst of a mental crisis in Eva Van Hove and Rufus Wainwright's glittering and extravagantly original musical adaptation of the Cassavetes film. I mean, it's not a heavily adapted screenplay, so I'm not sure to what extent original really comes into it, but we'll carry on. The film about a Broadway star in crisis might seem a natural fit for a stage adaptation, then again there is the risk of theatrical navel-gazing, and with its melange of gothicism, midlife angst, and thespy drama, an odd narrative arc to navigate. You can say that again. Opening Night is an extravagantly original production, every bit as eccentric as the film, but also its own alchemical creation. Alchemical? More vivacious in this musical incarnation. I mean, sure. The trope of the brittle older woman in crisis is well-worn, and Myrtle, an aging alcoholic actor, in meltdown over playing an even more aging actor on stage. Is she playing an actor? Is her character an actor? Sits squarely alongside Blanche Dubois and Norma Desmond, sure. But there is counterintuitive casting in Smith, who does not strive for Roland's unreachability or dangerous magnetism. Instead, her Myrtle has an earthbound glamour and a celebrity honed from hard graft, it seems. I get that. I, I very much get that sense. With a Brooklyn accent combined with a touch of Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, I see that as well. They have had her dye her hair brown for this show. The Brooklyn accent, I will say, is sort of that stereotypical, slightly dodgy, over-Americanized accent that British performers can do. Smith brings vulnerability, even flex of comedy, oh, for sure, and makes Myrtle's crisis modern, relatable, that of a woman wanting to age on her own terms. And I think, you know, I think it really would be if it wasn't for the very limiting material that undermines the seriousness of this to her and positions it as uh, something that she relates to watching the death of this 17-year-old fan. And that she, what she takes from that is, God, she was so young. I was young once. There is compassionate treatment of the drama's other midlife women too. Is there? Is there? I can hardly argue with this because this has been written by a female critic. Uh, but I, I didn't feel compassionate was was the prevailing adjective. A film crew follows the fictive play's rehearsals in a Broadway theatre, and a back screen gestures towards their captured footage. The screen magnifies characters so we see their bloodshot eyes and tears. When Myrtle turns up drunk at the stage door on opening night, the screen shows her staggering at the back of the Gilgood Theatre itself, a thrilling coup de high-tech theatre which resembles the walkabout in Jamie Lloyd's recent Sunset Boulevard, which we've already said, but services the story better here. Interesting. I mean, it, it makes more sense because the Sunset Boulevard one is very much non-literal because he's, as he's walking the streets of London, pointing at the Savoy and gesturing to a poster of Nicole Scherzinger in the show that says Nicole Scherzinger, it's clearly abstract. It's clearly breaking all kinds of not only the fourth wall, but the stage door itself because he's leaving the building. What do you call it when you're breaking the fourth wall by leaving the entire building? Breaking all the walls. So this one does enmesh itself more neatly into the plot, I grant you. Its tone is almost upbeat, but without clashing against Myrtle's core anguish. Much of that is down to Wainwright's slowly gorgeous music. Interesting. Finally, some praise for Rufus Wainwright here. The early songs have a springy chorus line sound. Do they? Okay. While later ones are full-bodied and tender with an edge of the operatic, bringing heat and intimacy to the drama. Performances soar too. Haas, that's Shira Haas, plays Dead Nancy like a bad fairy, singing the eerie I forgive you while perched on Myrtle's knee, and Hughes oozes dark intensity intensity in life is thin. And certainly I think if there are things that I can understand people connecting to in this show, it is those performances, it is those musical moments, and there's a lot of praise here for Sheridan Smith, for Shira Haas, for Nicola Hughes, uh, all of which I think is very deserved. Unadventurous musical adaptations of films comprise a crowded corner in the West End. Okay, so we're talking about the Pretty Womans, we're talking about the Mrs. Doubtfires, we're talking possibly about the Back to the Futures here, but this one seems to shake up musical theatre itself. Urgh. I, that That's frustrating to me. From the context of that sentence, when you're talking about those kinds of shows and this being a very different breed of film to stage adaptation, sure, I see that. But I do think that to say this shakes up musical theatre is incredibly unfair and incredibly dismissive of all of the other really brilliant works that aren't being considered when you make that kind of a sweeping statement. Something like Standing at the Sky's Edge uh, and a lot of the shows that actually feature original music for another thing. This is in many ways a fantastic, thrilling new year, finally, for new British musicals. And to give that credit to something like this, 
boggles my mind and frustrates me endlessly. It may be the most unusual thing on the London stage right now, I'd say that's fair, uh, and is captivating in its glittering strangeness. Well, evidently Aretha connected to this, and I can't fault that, and I can't question that. Perhaps we should just be glad that the play spoke to someone. And she's not alone. There is another four-star review that was published in Time Out. Here we go. Now, even with the much more positive reviews than mine, we can agree on the details that they pull out of it, because Andre Lukowski, who has reviewed this production for Time Out, says uh, Sheridan Smith is superb in Eva Van Hove, and Rufus Wainwright's deliciously odd, not really a musical. I don't actually disagree with much of that. I think it's odd in a way I didn't personally find delicious, but that's what taste is for. People don't find the same thing delicious in food, and so it extends. They don't find the same thing delicious when it comes to theatre. Theater. I also agree that it's not really a musical, it feels more like a play, and that Sheridan Smith is superb. Now these reviews are always refreshingly down to earth in their writing, so we'll enjoy this one together. It is, to be clear, fairly nuts that left-field European director Eva Van Hove has been allowed to plonk what I can only describe as a left-field European musical in a big theatre in the middle of London's glittering West End. Fairly nuts is one way to put it, I have many more thoughts about this frustrating express route that these prestigious directors have to West End real estate. There is truly nothing else like opening night in Theatreland at the moment, not even close. That I agree with again. Like much of Belgian star Van Hove's output, opening night is a stage adaptation of a classic art house film. Is it something about the British public? Do we have to hang our understanding of him on the concept that he is Belgian? Like, it's like Eva Van Hove and someone's going to be reading this if they're not big into theatre thinking, I don't know who that is. Oh, he's a Belgian director. Now I have some sense of understanding. What's that about, people? Come on now. Then we talk about the plot, talk about the camera crew that is filming rehearsals, something that doesn't have much impact on the plot. Most of the dialogue is Cassavetti's dialogue. Um, I like that that's acknowledged here, but does offer a loose real-world explanation for the director's trademark use of live film. As with much of his oeuvre, a big screen dominates proceedings, and what it displays is at least as important as watching the actors directly. The composition of the shots matters as much as the mise-en-scene. And yet, I think it was Sarah Crompton earlier who pointed out that it's very often filming at the edge because they walk in and out. And occasionally, though the whole documentary justification is not consistent because they turn up in places where the documentary film crew would not be, like filming the affair that Sheridan as Myrtle is having with her director, there are moments where they are feigning acting like a real documentary crew and so they turn away. And so we see these lingering shots of things that don't matter whatsoever because the cameras have turned away from our central focus. So I can't bring myself to agree with that one. Two particular shots dominate the first half. There's an extreme close-up of Smith's Myrtle from a camera embedded in her dressing room mirror that unsparingly rams home the fact she is indeed middle-aged. Wow, that feels a little bit barbed. And there's one in the rafters that relays top-down shots of the action that look perversely beautiful and unreal. Dreamy, Pina Bausch-like fantasies with some filter making the plain wooden floor look like flaking gold. I did not get that aesthetic sense. Was I meant to have a larger glass of wine? That's my question. The whole production feels suspended between brutal reality and waking dream. Sure, I would say fever dream personally, but we're almost on the same page. Smith is wonderful, her fading starlet isn't a hysterical diva, but a clever woman facing a legitimate existential crisis. I agree, and again, if we just had a little more depth and sincerity in the material, then that might really work. The cool, amused intelligence in Smith's eyes is glorious, as Myrtle elects to totally subvert a scene in which manipulative director Manny demands she take a slap from her ex-lover Maurice. Which, just you know, aside from the reviews, and aside from this show, going back to that being a concept of the original film, it is just a baffling premise isn't it? Smith has famously had her own struggles in recent years, and her performance is heartfelt but also surprisingly wry and mischievous. All qualities that you will always get from Sheridan Smith on stage, and which make her such an exciting, dynamic presence. It's in the second half that Wainwright's score really comes into its own. Earlier on, the songs, for the most part a deft marriage of Baroque folk and retro show tunes, are just a pleasing adornment, but as Myrtle becomes ever more detached from reality, it's reflected in the increasingly unnaturalistic use of song. I, you know, I don't know that I was able to discern that, simply because they didn't feel particularly naturalistic 
in the first act for me. So I didn't get the sense of progression there. I can believe that, you know, other people interpreted it that way and that that even was the intention. I just did not pick up on that. Pulsing beats and screeching guitars enter the fray and matters become even trippier. But after all of the very artistic, metaphorical, adjective-filled language that we've heard so far in all of these reviews, this is where we're going to get some of that trademark timeout down-to-earth quality. I liked Opening Night. It's not a traditional musical. I think perhaps it's not really a musical at all, but rather a play that uses songs to specific effect. And if they were effective, then sure. It's a weird, wry, very human vehicle for a superb group of actors to tell a story that looks like it's going to be an archetypal fable about a doomed star, but thrillingly pulls away from that. I, I'm glad someone was thrilled. I really am. Although it bears a superficial resemblance to Jamie Lloyd's recent Sunset Boulevard revival, to me it felt more like a negative of Van Hove's other musical, the Bowie collaboration, Lazarus. That's something we haven't heard invoked yet, uh, which I didn't get the chance to see, sadly enough. Both centre on individuals that have dangerously lost touch with reality, but where Thomas Newton, the hero of the icy, inscrutable Lazarus, has to die, Myrtle gets a chance to change everything. There are no dance numbers, power ballads, lavish sets, or cute romantic storylines. And this, this right here, is where you lose me. Because this is the type of musical theatre stereotyping that was invoked in that previous review by saying it shakes up musical theatre to suggest that musicals of this kind of tonal approach don't already exist, that artistic musicals don't already exist. We know plenty of musicals that don't have dance numbers, that don't have power ballads, that don't have lavish sets, that don't have cute romantic storylines. That is not a given in musical theatre. Stop acting like it is. And yet there's a palpable warmth to it. Maybe it's a musical, maybe it isn't, but under all the avant-garde bells and whistles, it unquestionably has a heart, a buoyancy, and belief in humanity that's lacking in the original film. You know what, maybe I need to go and watch this film. Maybe that's the enduring thing here, and evidently, perhaps that's something that I ought to have made time to do before seeing the show. I'm also of the belief that something should stand by itself, and that was kind of the measure by which I wanted to test this. In any case, we have heard a whole range of responses. We have heard four-star reviews. We have heard one-star reviews. I'm very curious to now hear what you have to say in the comments section down below. If you want to hear me expanding on my thoughts about the show, if you haven't already seen my review, you can go and watch that here on my channel. And for more reviews of shows that I will be seeing soon, that I've seen recently, make sure you're subscribed, turn on those notifications, and there will be many more video reviews coming very soon to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>